Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are. Um, I would like to welcome to our roundtable on uh, the economic crisis in Egypt. Uh, I would like to introduce, I would like to start by introducing my uh, two panelists today. Uh, um, Russia, uh, Helwa will not be able to join us today for uh, some emergency family uh, uh, issue that she has to take care of. Um, um, and so I would like to start by introducing Timothy Caldas, who is a deputy director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. And he's also an adjunct professor of international relations at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, where he's pursuing his PhD. His current research interests focus on political economies of the MENA region, countries, regime competition and survival strategies of an Egypt's foreign policy. He lived in Egypt uh, for 12 years from 2008 to 2020, where he worked in several fields, including as a visiting professor of politics at Hawaii University, a wedding photographer, an independent risk consultant, and a consultant at the UN Migration and Director of Communications as a Munafara Initiative. His writings were published by Meda Master Bloomberg, Foreign Policy, CNN, World Politics Review, and a number of other publications and institutions. Um, he studied at George Washington University and the London School of Economics and Political Science, George Washington, and the University, American University of Cairo. Um, welcome, and Timothy, where we are, sorry for the delay today. And we all um, uh, Mireille Mabrouk, who is an MEI senior fellow and the finding, founding director of the Institute's um, Egypt Studies Program. Uh, she was previously the deputy director and director for research and programs at the Rafiq Hariri uh, Center for the Middle East and Atlantic Council, and formerly a fellow at the Project for the U.S. Relations with the Middle East at the Brookings Institution. Mabrouk moved to D.C. from Cairo, where she was a director of communications for the ERF, or Economic Research Forum, and before being appointed Associate Director for Publishing Operations at the American University um, uh, in, in Cairo Press. Uh, Ms. Mabrouk has over 20 years of experience in both print and television journalism, and she is a founding publisher of the Daily Star uh, Egypt, which is now the Daily New um, Egypt. Uh, without any, and I am Marwa Shalabi, and I am an assistant professor in the political science and gender and, and women's studies uh, department at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And I'm very happy to have you both today. Uh, and I would like to start uh, with asking Timothy my first question about kind of giving those who are not too familiar with the with the Egyptian context and what's going on right now. I wanted to ask you exactly what went wrong and how did we get here? There are so many contradictory accounts of the root mm -hmm. cause of the ongoing economic crisis in Egypt. And I'm really interested to hear your take on that. Sure, my pleasure. Uh, and uh, thanks for uh, for hosting us. Uh, it's, it's great to be with you. Um, I think how we, got, I mean, how we got here is an extensive question, but uh, to try to make it relatively brief, uh, since since the overthrow of Mubarak, the political economic strategy of uh, the military, and particularly since the the coup d'état in 2013, the the political economic strategy of consolidating power has been predicated on really controlling uh, the distribution of capital in the country and controlling um, opportunities for growth and, 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 and enrichment. And so what we've seen happen, and this is this is derived to an extent from the, I think the military wanting to prevent the possibility of the kind of uh, crony capitalist center of power that the Mubarak regime was fostering from having an opportunity to continue to play a role politically. Uh, they, they're playing a role economically now, but but they don't really have the kind of policy or political power that they once possessed and what we see is that the military have, and the regime more broadly, I don't want to limit it to the military. When I say the regime, I don't mean in a pejorative sense. I, I'm referring to kind of the constellation of powers that have captured the state, right? So the presidency and the military, which are not the same thing, the general intelligence services and state security. And together, um, they have been ruling Egypt uh, for the last uh, decade. Uh, since the coup d'etat. Obviously, they've played an important role in ruling the country before that, but it, uncontested, I would say, to a large extent since then. And what they've been doing is 
sort of leveraging the state, having the state borrow large sums of money to to in, engage in a lot of uh, massive projects uh, that were funneled through particularly military-owned companies and military agencies that are not necessarily companies like the uh, engineers, uh, for example. Uh, and what they've been doing is they've been um, spending a lot of this money on what we call non-tradables. So these are uh, projects that don't have any export value. And Egypt's fundamental economic problem is that it ha- one of its fundamental economic problems is that it has a large current account deficit, which is to say that it's it, it's spending more dollars than it takes in. Um, and what has helped balance that historically has been uh, remittances. Uh, tourism has been an important source of hard currency revenue. And remittances are, I think, an, for, for, for outside observers, the, the fixation is often on the Suez Canal and uh, tourism. But actually, remittances are worth more than the Suez Canal uh, in terms of revenue, more, worth more than the Suez Canal, uh, foreign direct investment, and tourism combined. Um, so remittances play a key role in in the survival of Egypt. But what they but that get but that all of those sources of dollars have not been sufficient as of late, and so they filled that gap with with very high levels of external borrowing. Um, and so in borrowing this large sum of money, while uh, investing heavily in non tradables, they continue to deepen their dependence on external debt without building an infrastructure and building an economy that could get them out of the the need to borrow in order to continue to sustain this. Uh, And meanwhile, they have been engaging in a lot of activities that have deterred investment. So the military has been very expansive in its participation in the economy. It has an array of anti-competitive advantages. Uh, It doesn't pay taxes. It doesn't pay VAT. Uh, At times, it uses conscripted labor. Um, It's penetrated virtually every imaginable sector from fish farms to uh, to uh, livestock uh, production, to film production, to tourism, to cement production. Um, and it's done this in a highly aggressive fashion, at times really undermining uh, private sector competitors. So with cement, for example, it was already an oversaturated sector and the military came in and built the factory for over a billion dollars that really crushed kind of the the uh, the economic model of the private sector competitors, forcing some to halt production. A German-owned uh, factory reportedly looked into liquidation. It created an array of problems. Meanwhile, they during this borrowing period and this this kind of growing current account deficit, we've seen the uh, the central bank of Egypt, despite saying that the currency is floating after a, a dramatic devaluation in 2016, actually continue to manage and protect the currency. Uh, and so what that did was it, it made the currency look stable for a while, which increased confidence in the banking system, increased confidence in the currency for consumers. But it also prevented the market from getting any signal that imports were out of whack. Uh, and normally, if you continue to have this current account deficit, it would have downward pressure on your currency. And the result would be Imported goods would become more expensive, and you would, and so people would buy less of them. But that didn't happen, and so you have this kind of accumulating imbalance, um, and you have this while the uh, the 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 regime is kind of in the driver's seat of terms of economic growth. And the only thing that really kind of saved them in terms of growth figures substantially was the the gas that they were finding uh, in the last several years, which helped kind of bolster GDP figures. Uh, and the IMF acknowledged that the the GDP growth witnessed by Egypt since their intervention, their first intervention in 2016 under Sisi, was largely thanks to those gas fines and not actually the economic reforms that were undertaken at the time, which were largely superficial, to be perfectly frank. So you have that. Um, the The other fundamental problem is that um, that y- you. <clears throat> When when the, when you've had all this accumulation of imbalances, the the external debt of the country has gone from fifty five billion dollars in two thousand sixteen to one hundred and fifty five billion dollars uh, as of late, and you the cost of servicing debt is now consuming around nine percent of GDP, while the tax to GDP ratio is is hovering just around thirteen percent. So you can imagine the per the the proportion of the state's revenue that's going just to covering the cost of the country's debt. And then you get and you get hit with the pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and then of course this precipitates a domestic, uh, bringing everything to a head, and you have a domestic economic crisis with the collapse of the pound 
as the central bank is trying to save and conserve what dollars it can to cover its financing gap and be able to continue to pay off its debt. And they do this by throttling imports to try to conserve the hard currency that they have. And in so doing, they they ravage what's left of the economy because even Egypt's exports are dependent on imported inputs. So the result is that both importers, distributors, uh, and exporters are all running into problems because of the extraordinary measures being taken to conserve what few dollars are left. And Egypt's central bank right now, its reserves, uh, of the 33 or so billion dollars in the central bank, 28 of them are deposits from Gulf countries. So a $400 billion economy currently has $5 billion in cash in the bank. So we're, we're talking about a very, they're running on fumes. And they're, they're also in, a, in, a, in an uncomfortable position because they're heavily dependent on the Gulf. I'll wrap you up here because I, I, I want to uh, make time for, uh, for the rest of the discussion. But finally, this new IMF deal with $3 billion is, um, is largely predicated on external financing that will be based on asset sales because Egypt can't borrow more. So the, tr- the fundamental problem is that in 2016, what they were able to do to get out of the crisis that they had is not repeatable because they borrowed too much now and they've run out of, they've run out of runway. And so they're really facing an extraordinary economic crisis in the midst of a global monetary tightening that makes it all the harder to access credit. Um, there's a lot more to it, uh, but I, I, I know you only wanted us to go five minutes and I'm sure I went over time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there uh, and thank you. No, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Timothy. Mirat, um, I want to ask you about, um, it's, um, it's a draft budget that was just submitted a couple of, a week or two ago. Uh, the 2023-2024 budget was submitted for the, for the legislature for approval. Uh, we're sure it's going to go through, but, uh, but we have here, this budget had 56% of its total allocations would be directed to the debt servicing including repayments on the loans primary and, and interest, and also the state is counting on this revenue pool to fund this budget, um, and which 49% of which will come from the new debt. So what is the effect of this plan on the already dire economic situation in Egypt, in your opinion? Okay, so um, thank you for asking me on today. Um, so the effect um, actually runs on from, from what um, Tim was saying. Um, it's a bad idea. It is a very, very, very bad idea because what you are doing is compounding an existing problem. Um, Egypt has, it, it, honestly, Egypt has just relied too much on debt and relied too much on hot capital. Um, I mean, hot capital was useful for Egypt because uh, foreign investors were lured in by um, some of the world's highest interest rates and buying short-term Egyptian debt seemed like an excellent idea. The problem with hot capital um, is that it behaves, it always behaves reliably in the same way. At the first sight of trouble, it will leave emerging economies for developed economies because that's the safest thing to do. Um, back last June, the Egyptian uh, foreign, uh, the Egyptian Minister of Finance, um, Hamad al-Maid said, We've learned our lesson. We will no longer rely on hot capital. And yet here we are relying on hot capital. Again, um, what Egypt desperately needs to do is uh, uh, put a cork in its spending. All right. Um, Tim already outlined in enormous detail um, all the holes in in um, in Egypt's budget and uh, in the in the cash available to an enormous economy. Um, what Egypt needs to do is stop spending. It needs to stop spending on uh, uh, on things that are not essential. It needs to stop with the larger infrastructure programs. It needs to stop with things that it cannot afford, and it needs to turn around and pay attention to uh, uh, cutting expenses on uh, and, and trying to spend on, on the right things. Now, you mentioned the, the budget. The budget uh, um, laid in detail how much money was going to be spent, uh, um, um, how much money was, was going to be spent servicing that debt. Now, bear in mind that's important because 
one of the questions that's been asked is, um, is Egypt going to default on, on its debt? Is Egypt a new Lebanon? No, e Egypt is not Lebanon. Egypt is nowhere near Lebanon. It's a completely different issue. OK, and um, Egypt has um, never uh, defaulted on its debt. Now, if um, it, it paid about just over 25 billion in uh, uh, in the fiscal year for um, 2021, um, and then in uh, 2022, uh, in Last fiscal year, it repaid about 24 billion, but now um, that amount has, <laughs> uh, you know, has just ballooned out of shape. However, for it to be able to continue to just paper over all the tears in in that in that paper, it's going to have to make some very very hard decisions, and. Um, I'm hopeful that they will be able to just because of the severity of the situation, but it doesn't, I mean, honestly, successive Egyptian governments, I don't want to say this Egyptian government because successive Egyptian governments have not been great at making the right decisions due to various political considerations, but very often the right thing to do, the obvious thing to do has been ignored. Well, um, we are now out of time. The country is now out of time. And therefore, um, I am hopeful that the necessary changes will be brought about. Thank you so much, Mirat. Um, uh, Timothy, I want to go back to you, and i i want to I want to start where you where you left with the three billion dollar uh, support package that Egypt received uh, in December. Back in December, one of the conditions of this new loan is to expand the private investment. In a recent analysis, you argue that such an expansion is really unrealistic. Uh, can you share with us why you think this is the case? You, uh, Tim, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sure thing. Happy to. Uh, fundamentally, it's a really, uh, the, the business environment is quite bleak. Uh, so there's a lot of problems. Uh, one, uh, the private sector in Egypt has been contracting uh, virtually every month for the last seven years, right? So uh, there's a something called the Purchasing Managers Index, which measures kind of if the non-oil private sector is expanding or contracting based on surveys. And it's been contracting for all but nine months in the last seven years, 75 of the last 84 months. And it's been contracting for 29 months consecutively. Um, and, it's, and one of the main reasons cited uh, for that is weak domestic demand. So people don't have purchasing power. They and and that's driven by the elevated levels of poverty that Egypt has experienced due to elevated levels of inflation, the devalu which is tied to the devaluation of the pound, as well as the uh, over uh, dependence on domestic debt, resulting in a lot of printing of money. Um, and so you have a situation where the purchasing power of the average Egyptian is in steady decline. And in the past year, the Egyptian pound has been devalued by about fifty percent, which creates a situation where uh, you have even higher rates of inflation. So the infl the core inflation just brushed up against nearly 40% last month, which is higher than the peak we saw after the 2016 devaluation of a similar amount. However, unlike 2016, it's not clear that this is the peak because there's more devaluation anticipated. The pound is not floating. Uh, and there are still other subsidy cuts that need to that are that are part of the IMF program that will contribute to additional inflation, particularly cuts to subsidies on energy, um, which snapped back into place during the pandemic. So what you have is a, is a domestic environment where consumers can't afford to buy goods. Uh, you have complete unpredictability in terms of the currency and access to hard currency, which is necessary for doing business for a lot of Egyptian businesses. You have uh, so far no substantive reforms uh, of the way that the, the, the regime has been doing business, despite pledges to change. You have a rule of law environment that is abysmal. Egypt ranks 136 out of 139 countries, according to the World Justice Project. And this is not just a, it's not just a, a, a rights issue. It's also a, a business issue. If I can't rely on contract enforcement through the courts, then I only make business deals with people I know personally. And so that severely constricts the circulation of capital and the willingness to invest. 
And so a lot of domestic investors are highly reluctant to engage in contractual agreements with people who are strangers. On top of that, foreign investors are uncomfortable entering into a business environment where they could find themselves competing with the regime that is functionally above the law. And the new state ownership policy that's been proposed by the government is predicated on an array of public-private partnerships. But again, that would require you to trust that a long-term contract you sign with the Egyptian state will be fairly adjudicated in the event of a dispute. And there's good reason not to trust that that's the case. And a number of business people I speak to say there's a fundamental lack of confidence in the government and in their willingness to actually reform. Um, And we haven't seen any even superficial reshuffle, despite the extraordinary failure of the last several years, uh, of the of the leadership in the government. And so the result is a lack of confidence, a lack of uh, predictability, uh, a lack of access to hard currency, um, and a lack of consumers that actually have purchasing power. Um, and so it's, oh, and on top of all that, interest rates are extremely high and likely to continue to rise, which means that it's better to just keep your money in the bank and it's extremely expensive to borrow to finance a project. Um, so. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons why I don't think the private sector is going to be able, for the time being, to be a significant vehicle for growth. Um, and and I don't think that my, I'm uh, alone in that analysis, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I want to go back to Mirette. And Mirette, I want to ask you about the Gulf and the role of the Gulf in the existing Egyptian crisis. So Egypt really received tens of billions of dollars in bailouts from the wealthy Gulf monarchies over the past decade, especially since the Arab uprisings. Then more recently, the Gulf states are changing their policies and their support is clearly diminishing. So what are the political and the economic implications of the shift? Mirat, you're muted. So thank you for bringing up the Gulf. Um, in the, in the past, Egypt has relied on the Gulf, uh, um, you know, as the cavalry to come in and and uh, uh, you know just save the day when things have gotten bad. And that used to be for two reasons: uh, the safety and the security of the Gulf are intimately linked to, to Egypt's, and therefore it was always um, in the Gulf's interest to ensure that uh, Egypt is is stable. However. Um, this has changed. Not that uh, the Gulf doesn't need Egypt to be stable, it absolutely does, but the nature of the involvement has changed. And that has to do with a couple of things. It has to do with one, uh, the Gulf's own personal reckoning of its own finances and and the, uh, uh, the fact that um, its source of wealth in many ways is finance, that that's directly linked to climate change, is directly linked to a change in the way people uh, people perceive fossil fuels. And um, in many ways, the Gulf has said, right, we need to rethink what we're doing. That's one side. The other side uh, appears to be um, more subtle, but definite there, um, is the fact that actually two things. Uh, uh, on the one hand, um, the Gulf has felt that Egypt has taken them for granted. Right, but whenever there is a problem, we're just going to count on uh, uh, on the Gulf to, to pull us out. So there, there is a feeling that uh, the Gulf and their money and their support has been taken for granted. It hasn't gone down well. And the other thing is that uh, uh, in many cases, the, uh, um, um, the 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 political views of of both sides have slowly but surely diverged in uh, in many ways. Uh, I mean, for example, if you, if you remember back in 2014 when uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE asked Egypt to uh, uh, support them on uh, the, in their war in Yemen, and Egypt refused. Egypt had already done Yemen in the set in the 60s, and once was quite enough. Thank you. Um, so uh, they didn't, and the, the uh, Egypt has felt that. Uh, the Gulf, and particularly uh, the UAE, has not been supportive enough in its arguments, uh, in its sorry, in its um, negotiations, like with uh, Ethiopia, um, with Sudan, um, in um, in matter of the great, uh, the Grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. So there, there have been 
yeah, and of course on uh, on Libya. So there have been divergences. And whatever the case, the Gulf has put its foot down and said, right, uh, no more blank checks, no more deposits. And deposits, of course, are the easiest way to go. Now, Tim already detailed the amount of uh, uh, of money in deposits that the Gulf has uh, has, and, and I mean, the Gulf um, the Gulf countries between them own more than a quarter of Egypt's debt. Um, the IMF holds another fifteen percent. All right, so no more deposits. However, the Gulf is interested in investing because. <laughs> Regardless of everything, Egypt remains a good place to invest if only it can get out of its own way. Um, however, as an investor, like any investor, the Gulf now needs a return on its investment. And that means the right investment climate with the right rules, no more blank checks, and certainly no competing with entities that are not accountable and don't have to pay taxes and uh, you know and, and all the rest of it, again, as, as, as Tim outlined. So what we're looking at now is the Gulf has said, right, uh, um, and actually you want to bear in mind that the Saudi foreign minister said as much uh, about six months ago, no more blank checks. We are delighted to help, no more blank checks. I was just in Doha and they are super interested in investing, but the emphasis is on investment. What that means is uh, Egypt is going to have to pull its socks up in terms of the investment climate. All of the changes that Tim outlined that the Egyptian government has been reluctant to do, well, the Egyptian government now has a choice. It can make those changes or it can flounder because people always refer to Egypt as being too big to fail, which is nonsense. No country is too big to fail. I mean, if everyone remembers October 1929, uh, there, are, there is no country that is too big to fail. The consequences of Egypt's failure, however, are enormous because of its size, because of the size of, of, of the um, because of the size of the market, because it's uh, because of its geopolitical aspect. And so the consequences are enormous, and no one wants to see that happen. However, what you're looking at is possibly a change in the way that we do business. I mean, for example, the, uh, the Gulf firms have already set up joint investment firms. Uh, um, you know, the uh, Egypt Kuwait holding is is one of them. Uh, for example, the UAE and Saudi Arabia have already created shared joint uh, venture investment vehicles, and uh, Qatar is going to set up uh, another one as well. What these do is ensure that the I mean, there is um, one of the problems that the Egyptian one consistently had was the lack of accountability. Uh, and again, uh, Tim outlined many of the legal problems. But this is not possible in a joint invest uh, joint investment firm. So, um, and the idea, of course, behind all of this investment is that no one's going to be holding on to these firms forever. W what will probably happen is that the usual uh, amount of time for something like this is five to seven years before you flip a company and and uh, and and then take it on to resale. Uh, so. What you're looking at is uh, uh, the germ of uh, a new investment, uh, um, a new investment model in Egypt. It's new for Egypt because Egypt has been doing things its own way badly for a long time. But there is a possibility of change, and that possibility is only there because the Gulf has put its foot down and said, "No more." Huge market, I can make money, but I am only going to do it if I can make money. And that requires a rethink of Egypt's investment policies. Thank you so much, Mirad. That was a that was a really um, insightful uh, response. Um, so before I proceed with my third question for uh, for both of you, I want to ask uh, your permission if we can stay 10, 15 minutes longer if you have time since we started a little bit late. So would your schedule allow? I'm afraid I, I have a I have a ten o'clock. My okay. my apologies. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I unfortunately also have a, a, a meeting. I, I can maybe stay an extra five minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for your flexibility. Um uh, and uh, we're sorry about the, all the delays. Um so I think uh I want to I will then propose this this um we have 
We have a question here from the audience, so maybe we can take this question. If we have time, I can ask one more question uh, uh, to both of you. Uh, but Sabine, you can go ahead if you would like to ask your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for presenting. Um, I have a question for Timothy, um, a little bit on what you last said about the Egyptian currency. Um, so you said it was devalued as opposed to depreciated. Is that right? So this was a policy decision? Correct. Uh, and is this part of the conditionality um, from the IMF loans to devalue the currency? Not exactly. Um, it's the, the, the condition of the IMF is to float the currency, so to stop controlling the price. Uh, instead of doing that, they've devalued the currency, which is what they did before. Um, so this doesn't really come. So it doesn't satisfy what the IMF wants to see. It doesn't satisfy what the Gulf investors want to see. But it's a way to conserve. Uh, hard currency because it makes imports more expensive. Yeah, and exports cheaper. So that's what well, I we don't. Like. It doesn't work that well with Egypt because they don't actually. They, they're uh, the the investment in export in the export market has been very poor. So mm-hmm. they the, the upside on exports historically hasn't been that high. In theory, yes, you're right. That's the point. Like the the goal is to make exports more attractive. But in practice, Egypt hasn't really benefited from that as much as one would hope. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so the idea, I guess, like you said, it was just the alternative to try to save currency. It's a, it's a fundamental uh, reason behind it. Yeah. But until they float it, because of the shortage of hard currency, uh, there's a parallel market that's emerged. So uh, the official exchange rate is 31 to the dollar. Uh, the black market rate reached 40 to the dollar not too long ago. Uh, it's hovering probably around 38, 39 now. Um, so you have a, you can get 30% more for your dollar on the black market. So people are reluctant to put their money in the bank and, and lose that opportunity. So that's re- part of the reason why we're seeing a, a decline in remittances, which have dropped about 20% in the last quarter, uh, which is a major problem for Egypt's access to hard currency as well. So it's, it's, it's really, it's a vicious cycle. This policy is not sustainable. Uh, so one way or another, yeah, it's 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 gonna kind of fall off the rails. Thank, uh, thank, thank you. you so much, Tim. Um, um, Pierre, he has a question as well. Yes, uh, Pierre Landry, Chinese View in Hong Kong, and a GLD associate here. Um, okay, I I don't know much about Egypt personally, but from my what I heard from you both of you is that the situation is absolutely dire, and at the same time, you, know, you said it's not Lebanon, and it for some reason it's different. And I fail to understand from your description of the predicament that the government seems to be in that uh, that it is qualitatively uh, different from what Lebanon is experiencing. I mean, at some point, things have to adjust and uh, markets can be extremely brutal. Uh, and I don't see why, uh, given your own pessimism, at the end of the day, runs on the bank and things like that are not just as likely in Egypt as they have been seen in, in other places in the world. Sure. Um, do you want to? Yeah, Miret, do you want to go first? Since you need to, if you have to go before Tim, so we want to know. Actually, I actually I think Tim and I should should both. Uh, yeah. um, have a bash at this because it's always uh, it's always better to have a um, Lebanon's already collapsed, so to speak. Uh, it's a, a terrible way to look at it. Um, we're not likely to see. I mean, <clears throat> this isn't the worst that Egypt has has ever seen, and you're not likely to see a run on um, Egyptian banks. You always want to bear something in mind. Um, Egypt's um, Egypt's level of saving is is low. Always has been. Uh, um, it's very, very low saving, basically, because when you don't have very much money, um, it, it almost uh, 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 almost 55 percent of it goes towards food and stuff. And for those who have hard currency, as Tim pointed out, that hard currency is being hoarded. Um, but in any case, it, no, you're you're not likely to to see uh, runs on on banks. Um, so, no, it's not going to collapse. And by the way, I'm, I'm not pessimistic for me. I'm not pessimistic. I'm actually quite hopeful at the moment. That doesn't mean that uh, um, the only reason that I am hopeful is because things have been so badly mismanaged that we are now in a position where really the only way is up. Um, 
this does not mean that matters have not been mismanaged. There, I mean, I have never seen, uh, I, I mean, I, I've, I've been covering this for a while, and Egypt doesn't have stupid ministers, it doesn't have stupid economists. What it has is political regimes that have elected, for one reason or another, to cherry pick the reforms that they have to do and even with the the uh, the um even with the the 2016 IMF loan which laid out a similar set of reforms to made the Egyptian government persisted in cherry picking the reforms that it had to make which meant that it slashed through budgets because at the time you want to remember politically the the, the government and particularly the president were riding on a, a on a fairly high press of public approval at the time. So they slashed through the budgets and ignored the structural and institutional reforms that had to be made. All right. Um, and if you patch up bits of the boat, the water will get in through the other uh, through the other holes that you've done. Um, its inability or its unwillingness to make those reforms has directly translated into ill will with various creditors. Now, the this latest IMF reform, I it, Figures tend to get tossed around, and one that I see all the time is that Egypt uh, uh, asked for a $12 billion loan and got $3 billion. It's complete nonsense. I mean, I know where it came from. and that, but It is nonsense because if you take, I mean, if, if, you, if you know Egypt's background, Egypt is second in its uh, debt to IFIs only to Argentina. Right. It had already gotten a loan in 2016, hadn't done that much uh, with it. The idea that anybody was going to give Egypt $12 billion is ludicrous. Um, the Egyptians didn't ask for $12 billion because they're not stupid. Um, they asked for and got $4 million, three under the Extended Fund Facility and one under the, Resil the Resilience and Sustainability Fund. But as with any of these loans, what people are looking at is what you've done with them. So I'm hopeful. Um, but I'm hopeful because there is very, 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 very little wiggle room left. Tim, do you want to have a talk at this? Yeah. Tim. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the reason I don't uh, look, uh, I don't think Egypt and Lebanon have uh, enough in common to anticipate a similar type of collapse for a variety of reasons. Uh, most simply, uh, for all of Egypt's problems economically, it has a much more diversified uh, economy. It does produce things. I mean, it's not a great exporter of things, but it does produce quite a lot in comparison. I mean, Lebanon largely is dependent on remittances. Um, so when people lose confidence in the banking system, Lebanon basically ceases to have a functioning economy uh, in, in, a, in a, because it, 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 sorry, if they lose confidence that they can withdraw their dollars. So it's a different sort of situation. Um, the other problem, or the other difference is that Lebanon, even before, was sort of a high-functioning failed state. There's a, I mean, one of the problems that Lebanon has is that it doesn't have a government and doesn't have a president, so it can't sign an IMF deal. Like uh, Egypt's not been in that situation. Uh, it's on top of that because uh, I would say that I think Egypt might be uh, here. I'll disagree a little bit with Moran. I think Egypt might be too big to fail. Not, in the, but what I think is that the regime doesn't know what that means, or they're only coming to learn what that means now. So I think that they they thought that their size and their and their geopolitical significance uh, would result in continuing to access large amounts of credit easily in the way that they have for the last several years. What it in fact means is that they can be put on life support, which is what they're currently experiencing. Um, and so a trickle of support can continue to come in and just barely keep the economy afloat to prevent a Lebanon-esque situation. And there's, I think there's more interest in making sure that happens in Egypt than unfortunately there was in the case of Lebanon. I think that Lebanon's external uh, supporters were less concerned about where things would go in Lebanon than they are with, with where things will go with Egypt. And so that's an advantage that Egypt enjoys. But it's also just got a much more robust economy for all of its failings uh, than Lebanon does. Um, and I mean, Lebanon is also just a case of external political will, where it, whereas bailing out Egypt is getting quite expensive. Lebanon, I mean, it's expensive for Lebanon, but it's it's uh, it's a sum of money that's very manageable for many other people. Um, so I, I, I would say that there's a lot of structural reasons why I would distinguish between the two cases. Um, I, I think also it's difficult to get the uh, I I would say that. Um, 
it should be this is this is where i'm uh this is this is more speculative the amount of pressure that Moret cited should really force the egyptian leadership to finally pivot a bit on their uh, their appetite for reform and the advantage for them is that the money is there and waiting right there is there are people willing to buy these assets there is a hard currency that could come into the country to address this financing gap it is possible um lebanon uh it, it has a more complicated situation right now um it, not that there aren't solutions there are but it, it's not as straightforward may i just add something really quickly i don't want to say my worry and this is actually something i i discussed with with tim recently my worry is that the egyptian um government's inability to appropriately take advantage of what is on the table at the moment will mean that as tim pointed out trickles of money will come in to prevent the failure and what will happen is egypt will not fail but it will never get up off its knees and realize the potential of what is the, essentially the, the largest economy in the region in, in terms of uh, of people and potential and i think that would um honestly be the biggest failure of all so my right i know you need to go in 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 5 minutes so i want to sense you are the optimistic one here so so i wanted to end with this question about you you mentioned some you and tim in your presentations but i want to hear from you what is the way forward so what in your opinion what would be the most effective steps to resolve and mitigate the financial and the social consequences of the ongoing crisis in Egypt. Okay, so um I think that's going to take a lot more than the 2 minutes that I have left so I will try very quickly. Yes. Very quickly. Um Egypt needs to stop spending money it doesn't have. It needs to attract foreign currency by uh, uh by ensuring that the right circumstances are put in place for foreign investors to come in without worrying about what's going to happen to their money or uh, i mean when you talk to the egyptians they'll say well we've worked on bankruptcy collect uh, bankruptcy uh, uh litigation that that's great but you know now you can tackle the other 97 things on the list um it needs to ensure i mean <clears throat> currently interest rates have soared which which puts a, a damper on local investment but it needs to ensure the same sort of uh, um protections for local businesses as it does for um as it does for international international businesses may not want to compete with local entities but they're not worried about the kind of things that have happened to to local businesses uh, uh for example so it needs to be able to ensure that to ensure political stability <clears throat> it needs to ensure that its social protections are in place uh um it, but you also know that, for example in the budget the the spending on health and education is about a third of what is uh, uh constitutionally mandated which is ludicrous because um Egypt is a country that sets enormous store by security for political stability uh, uh, for political stability if it doesn't have that then uh, um it's not going to have uh, uh political stability um the social uh networks are, are are in place but they they need to be expanded simply because um they had been servicing about uh, 30% uh, sorry 10% of, uh, of the economy but that does not take into account all the people that have fallen into poverty beyond the poverty level after the 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 latest um economic uh, uh, uh crisis and inflation um and i think i should probably stop there in case uh, tim wants to say something the next time <laughs> tim what do you think I I mean I think that uh, I agree with uh, many of uh, Maret's recommendations. One other thing I would say is that they need to deal with their tax regime on a number of fronts. I mean the the, the tax the tax regime is a mess in Egypt. It's an antagonistic uh very uh disorganized system where literally tax collectors guess what you're what you actually earn and then like you make a counter offer to your filings and you have a negotiation to figure out what you should pay. Um Uh, the tax to gdp ratio in the country is anemic it's around 13% as i mentioned earlier which is just completely unsustainable and the the imf 
has been just leaning on on that as a as a way to plug this hole, but that both is not sufficient. You're not going to ever be able to extract enough revenue from VAT to get Egypt to a sustainable footing in terms of its tax revenue. But additionally, VAT is not only regressive, but has negative uh, consequences for the market and for demand because it drives up the cost of goods and it makes it so that it's harder for people to buy things. Um, and so the, the, the yeah, so. Build, building out uh, an infrastructure that could actually effectively collect taxes progressively is vitally important for Egypt's uh, fiscal health. Um, additionally, rule of law. We need, I mean, we need to see serious reforms in terms of the politicization of the judiciary and the uh, their ability to enforce contracts. And also the police complying with court orders. Police regularly ignore court orders. Uh, so you have a whole other problem. I mean, you have you see this most visibly with political prisoners where courts order people to be released and then the prosecutor and the police just collaborate to not do it. Uh, it's, it's, and then, and then the, the, when, when the Egyptian officials are, are, are questioned about political prisoners, they respond by saying, we, we have rule of law, we have an independent judiciary, we have a process. And, and it's just not true. It's fundamentally dishonest. Um, so, but rule of law has serious market implications, as I outlined earlier. Uh, and yeah, merits point and social protection is vitally important. Currently, cash transfers reach 20 million Egyptians. The I am the World Bank estimated in 2019 that 60% of the population, so roughly 60 million people, were near or below the poverty line then, before the pandemic, before the invasion of Ukraine, before this latest financial crisis. So that means 40 million people without any of these additional uh, crises were not receiving cash assistance and enduring all of this austerity and all of this economic hardship. And now it's probably 50 or more, right? So you have an enormous population that's receiving no cash assistance, is experiencing subsidy cuts, um, and is struggling to get by. And while Egypt for years has seen a decline in stunted growth uh, amongst children, it has been creeping up lately. Uh, and people's ability to buy food is, is starting to actually come into ser under serious pressure. And the government has been raising the prices on subsidized foodstuffs. Um, so there's a serious. Uh, sorry, I know Marat has to go. So, yeah, so there's a whole there's a whole array, array of things that need to happen. And of course, the military needs to get out of some sectors. They need to create some space for investment. And the and the and the investment needs to focus on exportable goods. Egypt needs to be able to bring in hard currency. And FDI is only going to do so much. Uh, in terms of making this sustainable, Egypt has to produce things and has to be able to sell them to somebody else. Um, and, and that's only going to happen if we stop lighting money on fire on cement. They're building a cement walkway in the middle of the Nile for no conceivable reason right now. It, it, everything is cement. Everything is cement. They're they, it, like it's, it's actually out of control. Uh, yeah. They just keep pouring concrete on everything. It's, it, it's become a meme throughout the country. Thank you so much for Timothy and Marat. And we really apologize for the delay uh, getting in. We really have some serious technical issues here, but we really appreciate your time and, um, and hope that you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. It was great being with you. Take care. Good to see you, Marat.